The USC Trojans are embarking their very first year in the Big Ten Conference. One more time for the people in the back. The USC Trojans are embarking on their first season in the Big Ten Conference. Get used to it because it's reality. We talked to Ryan Dyrud from the LA Football Network to preview all things 2024 USC football. From LA to Piscataway. All Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten Ten. It is the inaugural season for the USC Trojans in the Big Ten Conference. To preview everything USC, we bring in our guy Ryan Dyrood from the LA Football Network. And Ryan, there are some positives, certainly, about USC football. There's a lot of positives about USC football, but there may be concerns when you go from the Pac-12 and you come into the Big Ten Conference. You look at defense, you look at the trenches, right? Those are two key building blocks for Big Ten football programs. Maybe two parts of the USC team that have been struggles in the first two years um, under Lincoln Riley. What signs of encouragement have you seen where those two areas can be improved for USC this season? Yeah, Ted, first of all, thanks for having me. Appreciate being back on and talking Big Ten football with you. Still still getting used to saying that for SC, talking Big Ten, as it's always been the Pac-8, Pac-10, Pac-12, and now the, the Big 18 or whatever uh, they want to call it, just the B-I-G. But, you know, I think the biggest improvement, Ted, is the defense can't get any worse. I mean, no matter what they did this offseason, it cannot be worse than what it was last year. I think they finished 116th in total defense. Um they didn't dive into exactly what it stood for, but at spring practice, we were talking to Eric Gentry and, and they do at the end of all their workouts, they call it their 116. So I don't know if that's 116 reps, 116 seconds, whatever, whatever it is they do, but it's uh, in memory of finishing 116th in defense last year and kind of a reminder of what they cannot be this year if they want any chance of competing. So first benefit can't get any worse. Second benefit, I think they truly have gotten better. When you look at this transfer portal class, and if we're talking strictly defense, they've gotten some big key pieces that we'll talk about, I'm sure, later on in the show that, it, that bring a wealth of talent, bring a wealth of experience, and just bring skill sets that they probably didn't have last year. And thirdly, the coaching staff. And I think when you look at the hiring of Danton Lynn, what he did at UCLA in one season, turning that defense from the high 80s to the low teens, top 10, depending where you look at their ranking, uh, it was the biggest improvement in all of college football. When you look at Coach Henderson, what, uh, making him co-DC and defensive line coach, what he's done in the NFL with the Chargers and Rams, and now uh, you know his recruiting prowess and just developmental and relationship talent that he brings to SC. You look at Coach Doug Belk and, you know, being a DC in the league in the South at Houston, uh, a hot commodity. And then, as you know well, Coach uh, Matt Entz, who I think was just a phenomenal addition, head coach of arguably the best, just pure college football program in America. When you look at what North Dakota State is in the FCS and the national championships that he has brought there as a DC and as a head coach and now a linebacker coach. And so his recruiting of the Midwest his prowess with coaching up linebackers in terms of tackling and, and just the passion he has. He's a true football coach. Um, and then Sean Nua, they did retain Taylor Mays. They did retain who I think were two of their better defensive coaches last year. So long winded answer, but you, you look at those three things, uh, there's definitely going to be at least improvement in that area for SC. Yeah. You know, when you talk about make or break and when you talk about offense, you tend to side on the side of make when it comes to Lincoln Riley. And he has made a lot of great quarterbacks over the years, a lot of Heisman Trophy winners in recent history. And I want to start uh, with quarterback. Now, no doubt, Caleb Williams, Heisman Trophy winner a few years back, fantastic player, like you said, one of the best quarterbacks in USC history, but he played a lot of hero ball, right? And it made certain parts of the offense maybe look better and maybe other parts of the offense maybe not look as good. You saw what you had in the bowl game with Miller Moss and what he was able to do. He appears to be more structured in how he operates within his offense. Do you think that's going to make things easier? Is that going to be a little bit of a better fit, a smoother transition for Moss as opposed to what you had with Caleb Williams last year? Yeah, it, I think it's just going to be a little different. Um, I mean, Lincoln Riley's no, uh, you know, he's had off-script quarterbacks, if you if you want to call them that, and, you know, Kyler Murray and Jalen Hurts, and, and so it's not like the system can't succeed in that. However, when you look at the other pieces around the system, how much of it's been built for that and how much of it is built for 
playing within the system. And I think when you look at, as you mentioned, that last year was just year two. You're relying on the transfer portal, relying on guys that were there before you got there. So a lot of the offensive line was either very young or holdovers from previous regimes. And did they fit within that? Now that they have, you know, some young guys coming in, guys have now been in his system for two years. And now you have a quarterback in Miller Moss that can really capitalize on truly that system, making a quick one, two read, get rid of the ball, not dancing around again. This None of this is talking bad about Caleb Williams right. and his brilliance. It's just very different. And so you saw in that holiday bowl, not having Brendan Rice. I mean, obviously Caleb Williams, but not having Brendan Rice, not having Marshawn Lloyd, not having some of even your starting offensive linemen there. And the offense against the 16th ranked defense in Louisville was absolutely humming. I mean, Miller Moss broke the holiday bowl record for six touchdowns could have had seven because his one interception was in the end zone. Uh, the, the receivers were all over the place getting open. The ball was out of Miller Moss's hands quick. It was quick decision-making. It was truly the Lincoln Riley offense um, in all its kind of glory. So now what's going to be fun, Ted is seeing that in big 10 competition because we've seen that offense in the big 12, We've seen that offense in the Pac-12, which I think nationally aren't seen as powerhouse defensive conferences. And so how will that hold up against the Big Ten? Um, that's what's going to be fun to see. It's going to be a lot of fun to see those great matchups with explosive USC offense and their weapons, which is what I want to get to right now. Man, this wide receiver room is deep. When you look at Jacoby Lane, when you look at Deuce Robinson, when you look at Makai Lemon, hey, a lot of these people stepped up in the Holiday Bowl, didn't they, right? That sounds familiar. You look at Zachariah Branch. How about some transfers? Jay Fair from Auburn, Kyle Ford, who started at USC, UCLA across town. Now he's coming back uh, across town to USC again. This is a extremely deep wide receiver room. Do you think that's going to help out Miller Moss a little bit to kind of make him a, a better quarterback considering that he has, you split up four or five guys across the formation and they can all make plays in this offense. Yeah, hundred percent. And disrespect's not the right word because it's such an unproven room. So I get why they're not being highly right. touted as one of the top units just because there's a lot of unknown, but purely on, on recruiting prowess, purely on, you know, ceiling of talent. This, in my opinion, bias aside is one of the top receiving cores in the big 10. Now we have to see it. And that's why they've haven't been yeah. ranked highly. I think just because there's a lot of unknown guys. We've basically seen play one game in the holiday bowl for the most part. Um, but the talents there, the, the biggest key here, Ted is, you know, when you look at last year's offense with Caleb Williams, the top two receivers, Taj Washington, Brennan Rice, obviously Zachariah branch blew onto the scene as a, as a true freshman. So he's, he's back and obviously he's being to be a focal point, but all those other guys you really mentioned, Deuce Robinson had some play, but it was spotty here and there, but Makai lemon, um, Jacoby lane, um, even a little bit of Kyron Hudson who was a starter, yeah. but didn't necessarily get the production. All those guys in practice were more playing with Miller Moss yeah. because the aforementioned guys that went to the draft were in the ones with Caleb Williams. So the chemistry has been built already between these guys and they've come up together. And I know Miller Moss is a little older, but they've played together throughout practice all last year in the fall. Now all this year in the spring. So the fact that you have that talent, you have that depth of just anyone can be that guy. And then you have the chemistry that they've built. I think it's going to really kick this offense off quickly and it's not going to take time yeah, it's a new quarterback, but he's played with these guys a lot. So it's not like you're throwing a new quarterback into right. a seasoned receiver room where you got to get on the same page because so much, as you know, with the passing game is chemistry. And I think yes. these guys will have that. Um, and they've got up against a, a good defense this spring camp that I think has challenged them a lot more than what the defense of past years has. So that'll certainly help as well. Chemistry and timing in those route running, man, that is big. And to be able to have that experience with Miller Moss, uh, you saw it on display in the Holiday Bowl, and that's so key uh, to have that. I look at Jacoby Lane, you know, maybe he's the best all-around guy. But, man, I look at Zachariah Branch in a sophomore season, he's a guy that I think could really break out and be one of the best weapons of the Big Ten. Outside of Ohio State and Oregon, this could be a wide receiver room that really notches in there at that next level. So let's maybe move on to another part of the offense. Let's talk about the run game. Do you believe that this run game with Woody Marks coming in, Quentin Joyner, right, was a freshman, a part of that class, that first Lincoln Riley class. Do you think this running game is going to be more of a complement to balance out this offense or is this going to be a run game where they can line up and run it two, three, four, five consecutive times and really lean on that? Yeah, I think it's the latter, right? I really do. You know, I think this running game in Lincoln Riley's, not just tenure at SC, but even looking back yeah. to, you know, some of those Oklahoma regimes, you, you know, 
when he's offensive coordinator and you have what DeMarco Murray and, yeah. and some of these great backs at Oklahoma, I think it doesn't quite get the shine that the passing game gets because of the Heisman trophies, because of the elite receivers that have come out of the program. Um, but I think it's, it's a running game that has been good and it is now just going to be probably even more leaned upon just because of the style of play of the big 10. And like we said, you know, this is an offense that we've seen flourish in the Big 12 and the Pac-12. We don't quite know how well it will be, not just against a Big 10 team, but against an entire conference right. throughout the season long. So I think just based on what we see in these in these play packages, these personnel packages, as long as the offensive line, which we'll get to here in a minute, can, you know, hold up there in the deal, I think the offense will be productive. But the best way to counter anything is to have a very stout and strong running game. Woody Marks was Lincoln Riley said in spring camp, their number one target in terms of running back um, uh, transfers. And so they're able to get Woody Marks from Mississippi state, obviously played in the sec has played that, that big boy football and whatnot. So they get him big bodies. He's also really underrated in the passing game as well, but they got Quentin Joyner, Marion Peterson, who are going to be true freshmen, both from Texas. Uh, Quentin Joyner flashed as a true freshman here and there, and it looked great again in the spring game. I think the running game is going to be a lot more involved than just complimentary in this in this conference. And that's going to make this USC offense that much better. A USC offense that a lot of people are expecting to be very good this season. Now, for this USC offense to really get humming, you got to think this offensive line is going to need to be a little bit better. Uh, when you look at Elijah Page, who they really like over there um, at, at offensive tackle, he's coming in. You have a multitude of players that have started games over over their USC uh, career as well. We kind of talked about it before the hero ball that Caleb Williams played. I think a lot of people see that and they see Caleb running around and they see defenders pretty close to him and they think, well, this USC offensive line must be, must be pretty poor. But I'm not sure if that tells the complete story. What would you say is the story surrounding this offensive line as they approach 2024? Can they match up against some of these Big Ten defensive fronts? I think the offensive line had had moments of um, didn't look good, but as you said, and this isn't necessarily a knock on Caleb, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard to maintain blocks when you don't have any idea where your quarterback is, right? When, when he's rolling out and holding all the ball and he's running all over it, it's great for television. It's great for fanhood, but as a lineman at times, it's like, man, all we need to do is block for three seconds. If, if you can get rid of the ball within that time frame, and it makes us look better. So Miller Moss will give them that, I think. And, you know, that was most evident at the Notre Dame game. I was in South Bend at that game. And you can see from the bird's eye view that as great as Caleb Williams, Ibbs, that was his worst game by far. That was the offense's worst game by far. That was Lincoln Riley's worst game as the USC Trojans head coach. And a lot of that was because of the pass rush and, and Caleb trying to, I think, do too much and play without the system. There were many routes where if he was able to get rid of it right away, there could have been a completion and maybe first down. And, and instead there was a sack fumble or interception and whatnot. So, the offensive line, I think, is better than what is people thought. But I think the biggest key to this is you look at Jonah Monheim, starting tackle last year, came back for another season, which I think was very wise by him. They're kicking him inside to center. As of now, he's about 6'5", 305, which is a great size center, especially in the Big Ten, which if we're talking any position in the Big Ten, it's offensive line. I mean, you look at up yep. and down the board in the draft, offensive line, you're, you're looking at Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio State, Michigan State are all producing NFL caliber linemen. And so you got to get on that level if you're going to compete at that level. And I think having the size of Jonah Monheim, who is playing tackle, has the ability to play all five positions, but now he's learning center. We've heard that he's made the transition great. I think it'll be huge. Um, you have Pregnon and um, – uh, Mason coming back, Mason Murphy coming back uh, as well. And then Elijah Page and Al uh, Alani Nua, both freshmen who got some playing time last year that they're very excited about are going to slot in to start as true sophomores. And those are both huge bodies as well. Alani Nua is a mountain of a human being. So um, if you have that at your guard, that's definitely the size you want. So the big thing will be depth. You know, that'll be the big question is how the depth looks because they did get banged up a little bit last year. But I think the starting five, Ted, is going to be – Better than people will give them credit for. We'll see how they hold up, but I don't think it's going to necessarily be a, a a travesty in the Big Ten, but we'll see how they hold up. Got to have offensive line, and you got to have defense to be successful in the Big Ten, and that's where I want to go now, and I'm excited to talk about this Trojans defense and how they can improve this season. They bring in Dan Tinlin, among many other great uh, defensive coaching staffs, retooling this defensive 
coaching staff. Danton Lynn had a lot of success at, at UCLA, taking that from a defense that was in the 80s and bringing them towards a top 10 defense last season. That was just in one year. That was his first season in Westwood. Do you feel like he can have the same type of transition this year? And what's the realistic outlook that that type of flip can happen uh, with the Trojans? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously a great hire and Danton Lynn brings, you know, I think a lot of NFL concepts, which, which worked really well for UCLA. Um, you know, I expect a, a definite, a definite, um, really good in, uh, improvement, excuse me. Um, I don't know if it'll be at the, quite the trajectory of what UCLA simply for the fact that as, as good as USC has done in, in the transfer portal and some of this recruiting class, there isn't a Laatu Latu yeah. on the roster, right? Laatu Latu, the best defender in the draft, the first defender taken in the NFL draft, just an absolute monster um, for two years at UCLA, but even more well-rounded last year under Danton Lynn, where he was able to put him in positions all over the field as that kind of hybrid edge outside linebacker position where he's able to use him. You had the Murphy twins there who were able to do um, damage. You had Jay Toya in the middle. You had obviously some great linebackers in Oladijau and Moasau. And and then you had good secondary players. And two of those guys are at USC now in Kamari <laughs> Ramsey and John Humphrey. So that's the biggest improvement is that. So I think uh, Danton Lynn is going to be great in putting these positions, putting these players, excuse me, in a position to succeed. I think when you watched the defense last year, Ted, one of the most frustrating things, specifically for one of my co-hosts who who used to play football at USC, played safety, was that half the time the guys just didn't look like they knew where they were supposed to be lined up. Yeah. And there was just confusion at the line of scrimmage. They never set the edge. Tackling was atrocious at times, uh, in not just the open field, but at the point of attack. And so I think with Danton Lynn, at minimum, they'll be much more fundamentally sound. They'll be much more playing just freely in football, not thinking too much. And so in that alone, they'll see an improvement. And then as we'll get to now, they've also added a lot of good players, I think, that will help in that regard as well. I know when you look at Lynn's defense last year, it was really focused in on the front seven as a strength of the defense. But I want to look at the secondary because I believe that that is the biggest improvement, or at least talent-wise on paper, that they've improved the most back there in that secondary. You mentioned Kamari Ramsey coming over. You mentioned John Humphrey coming over. Achille Arnold comes over from Oregon State. Uh, DeCarlos Nicholson is a long, lanky uh, defensive back with a lot of range as well. I really like what USC has. Um, in the secondary, would you agree that this is uh, slated to be the best group out of the three groups um, on this USC defense this year? Yeah, I think that's that's fair to say. I think linebacker, and we'll get to that, is going to be good as well. Obviously, linebacker, it's you know two to three positions on the field. So in terms of just impact, I think the secondary is absolutely what you're 100% correct there, Ted. I mean, not only is it a, a super talented starting group, but it's it's an extremely deep group when you look at it from top to bottom. Um, and who they got, all the guys you mentioned, but even the returning guys in Jalen Smith, Jacoby Covington, Prophet Brown. I mean, those are all three guys that were at times bright spots on a very bad defense last year. And so you get them back. Plus you have incoming freshman in Marcellus Williams, who, you know, has lit it up in spring camp and is a local kid and, and has they've been saying countless times, Doug Belk, Lincoln Riley, Danton Lynn, that he's absolutely going to be in the running for, for starting quality time as a true freshman. And so when you have that talent that you just talked about in Arnold, Ramsey, Humphrey, Smith, Covington, and you have a true freshman that's going to battle for starting reps, it's the best, in my opinion, the USC second D has been in not just the Lincoln Riley area, but you can go back a long time, maybe even predating Clay Hilton before that. So, we got to see it all together on the field. Right. Obviously, we're in, in July right now, kind of talking about how this is going to unfold. So we got to see it when you're going up against these, these offenses and these receivers. But if we're talking Big Ten football, Ted, and talking trenches and, and strong defenses and, and what these offenses look like, I think USC is in a good spot to at least in the secondary. They're not going to get beat in the secondary by what the Big Ten does on offense, in my opinion. So with the secondary, the strength of the defense, and when we talk about Danton Lynn and we go out, when we talk about Coach Henderson up front, we feel, I think, I, at least I feel, I'll say, and you can kind of give your piece on this here in just a minute, that there's going to be some development up front. And although maybe the Isaiah Rakes thing didn't work out and maybe he was going to be that piece next to Barry Alexander, 
this defensive line, I think, can develop over time. Like, it might not be the best in the beginning of the season, but the more this season goes along and the more these guys spend time um, with this coaching staff, you got to think that they're going to develop. Do you think the way that this scheme is structured, that that's going to free up a lot of these guys up front to make a lot more plays? The Jamil Muhammad, Gavin Meyer coming over from Washington, Barry Alexander, guys like that. Do you think that that's just going to naturally work itself out and these guys are going to develop and become better up front as the season goes along? 100%. I mean, this is where this coaching staff is going to have their biggest impact this year. Obviously, yeah. they're going to have to recruit well and, and be able to retain guys that they do recruit. But when you look at who is currently on the roster, um, whether it was their last year or coming back uh, or coming in the transfer portal, as you mentioned in Gavin Meyer, yep. um, I think they're definitely talented guys that the system did not do them any favors. Right. Like yeah. Anthony Lucas, a guy from Texas A&M, comes in last year, highly recruited, high star guy as a young kid, comes over, really was unheard of last year. No one really, he didn't, he wasn't able to start a lot. He did get reps, but was here and there, wasn't able to truly kind of fit the mold in this. And he's a guy that isn't on the Latu Latu level by any means. Right. But in this system with these two coaches, I think we're going to see a lot more than Anthony Lucas. You mentioned Jamil Muhammad was a bright spot on the defense for leadership, for his veteran um, presence. But at times, at some games look dominant, other games didn't look dominant just because they didn't have that edge-setting presence alongside him or whatnot. So I think he'll be able to get a lot more. And then, you know, when you pair Bear Alexander and Nate Clifton in the interior, I think you have two really talented guys I think that can get a lot done. Their biggest issue right now is the depth. And so right. how this unit not only develops, but how they stay healthy is going to be extremely um, key to how this defense continues to evaluate and perform especially against the hard hitting uh running game of the big 10 and so they're going to rely a lot on their linebacker which i think is a big strength this defense yep. as well but if they can develop quickly and then the last thing i'll say ted is this incoming class they got a lot of defensive line help in this incoming class you look at cameron fountain you look at lorenzo cohen yep. you look at jai babasari um out of the state of minnesota um big body guys that have put on a lot of weight in spring camp as high school seniors and going to be freshmen they're going to get playing time right off the bat, in the Big Ten as as freshmen. So how they develop and how quickly they feel comfortable as young kids is also going to be very key. What's your confidence level in this front seven? Because you factor in that linebacking core. That includes Mason Com, Easton, uh, Easton Mascarenas, Arnold also coming over from Oregon State. What's your overall confidence right now in this front seven? Yeah, I think in the linebacking room, it's real confident. Um, you know, talking to Ents, you have a lot of vets there, right? Like the future is the question. I mean, they, yeah. they could be losing five linebackers after this season. Yeah. Um, and they do have some guys in, you know, newbie, Elijah Newby and others that are in this 24 class and then others in the 25. But, but when you look at Mascarenas Arnold, one of the best PAC 12 linebackers during his tenure at Oregon state and in the spring game, you could just tell he's the leader of this defense. Right. I mean, he, he is, if they're doing green dots, like they do in the NFL, he's the green dot. I mean, he leads this defense. Mason Cobb, I think, was great at Oklahoma State, had a down year last year, and I think it was a lot of it was scheme and, and you know, the guys around him or the scheme not doing him any favors, but I think he's going to have a big bounce back year. Eric Gentry, another guy you mentioned, um, been in this program now for three years, you know, has just freakish length when it comes for linebacker. And so I think they're really confident in this linebacker room being able to kind of carry that leadership role, be the second layer of defense against the run. Um, and as I mentioned, I think they're really confident in their starting front it's the depth that's going to be the question mark and the, how quickly the youth can kind of learn and, and be comfortable in their bodies against these massive offensive lines they'll go against but to give you an answer i think they're they're confident but they know there's there's a lot of room for growth and improvement let's dive into the schedule it is I don't know if the Big Ten did the USC any favors. Let's just put it that way, right, when, when it comes yeah. to the schedule. They're going to kick things off against the LSU Tigers in Las Vegas on that Sunday to open up the season. And this is a very interesting game. Previously here on the show, I highlighted this game as a very big week one game um, for the USC Trojans. Could it create or derail some momentum? That's been kind of thrown out there that it could kind of set the tone for the rest of the season. How big do you view this game against LSU when these two, when Brian Kelly and Lincoln Riley seems look in the mirror, they see pretty much each other when you talk about the Tigers and Trojans. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Um, I think it's a huge game in the barometer of where this team is at. Right. I don't think it's necessarily Im important is the wrong word. I don't think it's like going to the, the win or loss, I don't think is going to derail right. the season. Yeah. If you get blown out, 
then that's that's a problem, and that's yeah. going to really be detrimental to this team who then gets Utah State at home and then goes straight to the big house right after that. So as long as they play good, competitive, fundamental football, I think a win or loss isn't going to derail the season. I think they can, as long as they can compete, prove that they can play that brand of football that's required and not just the SEC, but obviously the Big Ten. Um, I think they'll be okay in terms of that. It's going to be a lot of fun, Ted, to watch these quarterbacks, right? <laughs> With Miller Moss, Garrett Newsmeyer down there uh, in Baton Rouge. You know, both these kids recruited by these two schools, same recruiting class, didn't transfer out, waited their time when other QBs transferred and took their starting jobs, and now – hasn't been officially confirmed Miller Moss is the starter, but we all think that's going to be the case uh, that these two guys finally get their shot and get to go up against both being top 20 QBs in their respective classes. So really fun to see that storyline. Love seeing kids that kind of stick it out with their original commitment and, and trust the development they're getting, but it, it's going to be a fun start to the season. That's for sure. So year one for Lincoln Riley, they're one win away from a college football playoff. They drop down to seven and five. And then I look around at the rest of the schedule, like, Eight and four is a possibility, and I don't think it's the worst thing in the world if USC goes eight and four. Like outside of LSU at a neutral site, at Michigan, home against Penn State, home against Nebraska, home against Notre Dame. Now you see a lot of those games at the Coliseum, which is very encouraging for for them as well. And you're going to see some 50-50 games uh, against some of the other, you know, the Maryland's on the schedule, maybe the Minnesotas on the schedule, uh, teams like that. But what do you view as realistic expectations? What do you view as a ceiling for this Trojan team in their first Big Ten schedule? Yeah, it's 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 a brutal schedule. It's a fun schedule. I mean, it's yeah, going to be right. extremely fun to cover uh, for fans out there. It, it should be a very fun welcome to the Big Ten schedule. Um, you mentioned it having non-conference games against LSU and Notre Dame, and then you still get your rivalry with UCLA, um, plus you know all the great Big Ten matchups. And, and I'm excited to go to the Big House. That'll be fun to yeah. be out there in Ann Arbor for the first time. But yeah, I think this team. You know, I, I think you hit it right on the head there. I think eight and four is very realistic. A lot of fans will see that as a down season after going seven and five or eight and five with the bowl game last year. But I think with with how much has changed with all the newness that is in this new conference, you know, with the quarterback change and all this, I think that is still a very good season. I do think if everything goes to plan and and you know this as well as anyone, Ted, like the best teams in college football, like a lot has to go your way. Like yeah. you have to stay healthy. You have to have, you know, the ball bounce your way in certain situations. You have to get certain calls in certain situations. Like it's not just that, yeah, you have to be the best coach team, some of the best, you know, blue chip players, but a lot has to go to your way to make it to that final, that final, you know, weekend of, of college football history and whatnot. And so if that happens, I, I can see USC being a 10 win football team. I think they can get to there, but I think eight to nine is more realistic. Most likely Ryan USC is coming to Minnesota. They're coming to the twin cities. Let's hope we can get together then and figure something out. It's always great to talk to you. Always great to talk Trojan football. We're fighting on here on this channel. And Ryan, thanks for previewing the USC Trojans 2024, a big 10 football team. We'll see it on the road. Yes, Ted. Thanks as always. Can't wait to be in Dinky Town and uh, and meet up. It'll be fun. Absolutely. Thanks for watching Big Ten Ted, where it's all Big Ten all year long. Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses, and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.